Hi there, and welcome to Joy Sightings, edition 11. Today I'll read to you Safed the Sage's parable, The Man from Jonesville, and then a parable by G. William Jones, Lying Offshore. The Man from Jonesville Now there was among my neighbors a man whose name was Smith, and he was from Jonesville. And he told me often of Jonesville, what a lovely place it was, and how everyone who lived there was happy and virtuous, and how sorry he was that he ever had left there, and how he wanted to go back to Jonesville. And when the men in the city where I lived failed to clean the snow off their sidewalks, or the city council indulged in graft, or the children were rude, or there was an early frost, he told me that such things did not happen in Jonesville. And this continued for nigh unto twenty years, and the older he grew, the more he talked about Jonesville. And I told him I hoped that when he died he would go to Jonesville. Now it came to pass that he prospered, so that he retired from business, and he sold his house and lot in the city wherein I dwell, and went back to Jonesville, that he might spend his last years in peace, and die in Jonesville. And we all bade him farewell, with something of sorrow and something of relief. And it came to pass that at the end of six months, he and his wife moved back and bought their old house for a thousand dollars more than they sold it for, and they were tenfold more happy to get back than they had been to go away. And it came to pass on an evening that Keturah and I called on them. And I said, Old fellow, tell me on the level, what was the matter with Jonesville? And he said unto me, Speak not to me of Jonesville, lest I do thee harm. It is the toughest joint this side of state prison. The dear people we knew have all died or moved away, and they who are in their places are unneighborly and snobbish, and they do outrageous dances and other stunts, and their kids are the limit. We have come back to dwell in the place where we have spent twenty happy years, and we have but one favor to ask of our old neighbors, and that is that they never speak to us of Jonesville. And as Keturah and I walked home, I spake to her and said, Keturah. And Keturah answered, I know what thou art about to say, and I suspected all the time it would be just so. And I said, There are many men and women who sigh for some Jonesville or other, who might be decently happy where they are if they would but make it their business. And Keturah said, Our Jonesville is right here. And I said, Amen. Lying Offshore From the Innovator by G. Williams Jones. A ship rocked slowly upon the greasy seas. Its sails were tattered, its masts spliced, and its hull leaky with worm-eaten planks, but still it stayed afloat. It had been sailing for many years, for generations, actually. Many years ago it had been loaded with food and medicine and dispatched to find and help the people of a lost colony. As it traveled far and wide, all its original crew except one had died, their places being taken by their children. In the prow an old man, the last of the original crew, sat upon a coil of rope, his watery eyes struggling to pierce the fog. Below decks, men, women, and children sat down to eat. Although the fare was meager, it was adequate, and all their faces shone with health. The meal was almost over when both doors of the mess room were thrown open with a loud noise and a rush of wind. In the opening stood the old man, strange and wild, stronger than they had ever seen him, and shouting, "'We're here! We've arrived at land!' Land, they asked, not moving from the table. What land? Why, 
the land we were sent to when the voyage began. And the lost colony is there waiting. I can hear them shouting from the shore, shouted the old man, stamping his feet with impatience. Quick, let's make for shore and unload the food and the medicine. The old man turned to run back up the gangway, but stopped halfway up when he realized that there had been no movement in the mess room. Slowly, he returned to stare at them with wide, incredulous eyes, his mouth agape. Didn't you hear me? Are you all deaf? I said we're here. The people we were sent to help are only a few hundred yards away, and we must hurry, for they are all hungry and sick. Then one of the men said, I'm sure we'd like to help those people, but as you can see, there's hardly enough food and medicine here to take care of us and our children. Besides, said one of the women, we don't know what kind of people they are. Who knows what might happen if we landed and went among them? The old man staggered back as if he had been struck across the face. But, but, it was for them that this voyage began in the first place so many years ago, for them that the ship was built, for them that the food and medicines were stowed aboard. Yes, old man, I've heard many tales of our launching from my father and from the other old men who are now dead, replied one of the younger men. But there were so many different accounts that how can we be sure which one is right? Why risk our stores and provisions, perhaps even our lives, on something we may not even be supposed to do? He's right, he's right, shouted many of the others now quite excitedly involved in the conversation. But look, said the old man, trying very hard to contain himself, it's all very simple. As far as there not being enough food for us and for them, much of what we have left is meant for seed. If we go ashore and plant it, then there will be more than enough for all. And on the matter of why the ship was launched in the first place, you have merely to look in the logbook. It's all there. The old man, hoping he had settled the question, looked anxiously from face to face around the tables. There was a long, thoughtful silence. Finally, a man who had gravitated to a position of leadership among them stood up, picking his teeth and frowning thoughtfully. Perhaps the old man is right, he said, loosening a juicy morsel from between his two teeth. At any rate, his suggestion merits investigation. What I propose is this. Let us select from among ourselves a representative committee which will see if they can find the old logbook and then go into a thorough study of it to see if they can determine whether we should land or not. A sensible idea, they all cried, except for the old man. Let's do it. The old man, now frantic with hearing the cries from the shore, shouted, What is this? What are you doing? Oh, he said, backing away from them with horror in his eyes. I can see that you do not really expect to do anything at all. His back against a bulkhead, he clutched at his chest and slid weakly to the floor. He gasped. Let me warn you then. The food will not last. It was meant to stay preserved only for the time it would take to get here. Now the food will begin to molder, and the medicines will separate and lose their strength. If you do not take the provisions ashore and share them, they will soon no longer feed or cure even you. With this he died. As the days and weeks passed, the ship continued to lie offshore. The committee continued to search in the logbook, which they had rather quickly found, hoping to come up with a report in the very near future. A few of the younger men and women, maddened with the waiting and lured irresistibly by the cries of hunger and pain from the shore, slipped away one night in the jolly boat with a few provisions and were listed sorrowfully next day as lost at sea. True to the old man's dying prophecy, the food on board began to grow all manner of weird and exotic fungi, 
and the extensive stores of medicine seemed less and less able to cure the ills of the people. Also, the cries from the shore began to grow so much louder that even the deafest on board had to stuff his ears with cotton in order to sleep. But no one seemed to be able to decide what to do. 